The last few weeks have been incredible in a way that I didn't anticipate. As I'm sure you folks all know, a war has recently started in Israel. Hamas, the Palestinian rebel organization, has launched a revolt against Israel, and the fighting since has been absolutely brutal, to say the least. When everything's said and done, Israel is the size of New Jersey— it's not China, America, or a great power that will by itself change the course of history. However, the world stands with bated breath about if Israel will create a chain reaction pulling other countries into a global war. In the same manner that Bosnia itself was irrelevant, but it stood at the crossroads of history in an interconnected web of alliances that sparked World War I, and thus the course of the 20th century that we know today, could Israel set us up for another world war? Looking at situations like this, you may see many things going on that you can't control. But what you can control is your meals. Cook Unity is the first chef to you meal delivery service. Made up of over 70 chefs who believe that great food should be for everyone, these meals save me a lot of time and taste excellent. Each week, award-winning chefs craft hundreds of globally inspired meals from vegetarian to paleo and everything in between. Meals are delivered fresh, never frozen, and the menu rotates every week, so there's always something new to try. Another thing I like about Cook Unity is the flexibility of the subscription. You can pause, skip weeks, or cancel at any time. I got a keto turkey burger, which helps me stick to my diet and tastes great, with green beans and mushrooms for a well-rounded and hearty meal. The chefs are really dedicated to their craft, like Dustin Taylor, who has over 20 years of experience making excellent meals. Cook Unity is an excellent service that anyone can enjoy, so go to cookunity.com slash whatif50, or click the link in the description and use the code whatif50 to get 50% off your first order of Cook Unity meals to try them out for yourself. For a disclaimer for people new to my channel, one of my catchphrases is that I'm betting against God. What I mean by that is that there are infinite ways to be wrong and only a handful to be right. The world exists to defy our expectations and is in its nature incredibly chaotic. I don't know what will happen, and anyone who claims to is lying. Even the great governments of the world, who have much better information sources than I, and probably more great minds working together than I, are stabbing in the dark. I change my predictions of the future every year, since... I am incapable of understanding every factor everywhere, which is what's necessary to predict the future since everything's interconnected. So, take what I say with a grain of salt. That being said, our era of history is like a dam that's about to break. Long eras of peace set up growth which changes the assumptions of how the world works, which means that the social order that was established at the end of the last period of blood is no longer effective. This then means that a series of bloody wars is necessary to establish a new order. The powerful do not give up their authority easily, and across history, war is necessary as a reset. This is why, when you read the history of the world, war is so common. In the pre-modern world, there wasn't a concept that time was linear. There were some eras that had more time than others. There were eras of history where time moved faster and more strongly given those moments that determined the fate of history for centuries after occurred then. There were hours where decisions were made that would be more influential than a century of bureaucratic management during peace. As Lenin said, there are hours in which decades worth of history happen. History either moves glacially slow or like lightning. The reason that history is impossible to predict is that it's impossible to see the infinite amount of factors that go into those decisive seconds. You could look at demographics, the self-interests of various players, and more, but you can't tell how those factors roll pile up on top of each other at that very moment. This is something I want you all to keep in mind. Whether or not we have a world war will be decided by a handful of people in the world's major governments. A series of dominoes have to fall for it to happen, and whether or not they do is not really under our or anyone's control. Someone once said about World War I that it was a series of rational decisions made by the governments involved that when added together created madness. 
That's where we are now. I don't think any of the world's governments want an incredibly bloody war. They all want to get their goals, whether the conquest of Taiwan, the defeat of Israel, or more, as cheaply as they can. And for them, that includes losing as few of their lives and as little stress as possible, so not having a global war. However, since they're desperate, they will end up adopting short-term strategies that, in the long term, may add up to madness and global conflict. The world's countries are all desperate, and because of that, they will make miscalculations that when added together could create a symphony of horror. This video will be annoying to watch in one way. It's since that in many ways this is a culmination of about 30 other videos I've made. I'm going to be making a litany of claims that may seem ridiculous, but that I've spent half an hour to an hour unpacking in a previous video. There might be certain claims where if you're new to this channel, you might not agree with, which I'm only going to touch on in passing here. I will have the image of the video that I'm going to reference, and you can look it up and watch it in your own time. This is in many ways the culmination of my entire what a felt his career, with the amount of citations I'm about to make. If you've watched all these videos, I guess you get bingo, and I'll send you a cookie. The thing is that the scenario we are facing now is something I unpacked and predicted in multiple videos years ago. I'm making this video since I think we need an update to see what will actually happen and what did occur. However, that means that this will be more focused on the individual scenario happening here rather than the underlying logic. Okay, the speed run of what's going on here, which I explain in further depth here, is that due to complicated demographic factors which increase inequality and lower the value of labor, almost every country in the world is seeing legitimacy crisis in which their government is barely surviving. For almost any country you can throw a dart at, whether the US, Russia, China, the European Union, Brazil, Africa, or the Middle East, they are a bad winter away from social collapse. This is something I've covered in these videos. This is a historical trend which occurs roughly every 200 years and is an entrenched historical pattern. The last time it played out in the Western world was the French Revolution, and the last time it reached its full global potential at the same moment was in the 17th century. In the year 1645, almost every important country in the world is having both a civil and international war at the same time. This is a video I've made comparing the modern international order to the 17th century, with which which I think there are incredible similarities. When we think of war today, our only thought process is of the world wars. However, the difference in us and them is that the societies in the first half of the 20th century were unified, coherent, motivated, young, wealthy countries, which were fighting each other since they had so much energy that they needed to conquer to let the pressure out. The world wars were, as I said before, demographic ejaculations. Across the world, societies are completely divided. Most people are poor, lonely, alienated, nihilistic, and don't want to die for their country. We have cripplingly high inequality. People aren't having kids, and the entire world is facing aging. Before World War I, young men were happy to die for their countries and viewed it as heroic. Even for World War II, there was enough social discipline to carry out a draft. Imagine trying to draft a Gen Z and get them to charge a machine gun today. What would they die for? This is much more comparable to the wars that occurred in the 1600s. These countries were torn by religious differences, much like the political ones we have today. Most people were poor and barely getting by, and most people were starving too much to be good recruits. Even so, they were needed too much to be a tax base to draft the entire young male population, while the countries themselves didn't have enough legitimacy to maintain a draft. The U.S. Army did a survey and found due to a combination of obesity and mental health issues, three quarters of Gen Z men weren't in a position to serve in the military if there was a draft. What the wars of the 1600s looked like instead were limited wars aimed at the destruction of the other country's economy, mostly done through proxies. It was fought largely through small armies of mercenaries. What ended up occurring was that countries would start external wars to keep their populations unified. Around the year 1640, almost every country in Europe was fighting an external war and a civil war at the same time. It's a pretty common strategy around history for countries to start an external war to unify their population. It works about a quarter of the time in my estimation, with the English in the Hundred Years' War or the Dutch in the Thirty Years' War being examples of it working. However, it horribly backfires in most cases, such as the Russian 
Russians in World War I, the French in the Hundred Years' War, and the Spanish in the Thirty Years' War, among many more. There are a bunch of different things going on here, which I've covered through these videos. Aging is destroying a lot of countries, especially China or Russia, meaning that they have to conquer outwards before their societies collapse. As America experiences internal problems, it makes it difficult for the Americans to maintain their intercontinental empire, which means our enemies, such as the Iranians, Chinese, or Russians, have the best opportunity they're going to get to push their agendas. Like World War I, there are a series of independent political problems around the world that are tied together in a web. Lighting the web in one area has the potential to blow the entire system up. The international order that was established in the aftermath of World War II isn't tenable anymore, and the system is breaking down in one of a thousand different ways. I made this map before of potential places the international order could break down. It's basically a frontier map between the American allies, which hug the coast, and the Russo-Chinese alliance, which I sometimes jokingly refer to as the former Mongol Empire, whose borders it almost perfectly mimics. I predicted for a bunch of reasons that the Middle East was the most likely place for the world order to explode for a litany of reasons, which basically boiled down to, of course it would be the Middle East. I didn't know if it would be Israel, but I knew Iran would be involved somehow. Now, let's break this down on a more regional basis. As a brief side note before the video keeps going, one of my friends has a service that's cancellation insurance, and it's a company called Pluribus, and the way it works is that if I get demonetized on YouTube or this channel gets wiped out, which we all know could possibly happen and is a very real possibility as the world gets crazy, I don't want to have to give up this channel, and I want you guys to keep making these videos, and I can't go back to college. And so the way this service works is that you pre-pledge money in case the channel gets demonetized or taken down, and then once you've pledged money, under those circumstances, it will all be pulled together to support me in case the channel goes down so I can keep doing this work and we'll have time to adjust. So if you have the extra money, please go on a pluribus and support my cancellation insurance so that I'll be fine and have an opportunity to speak freely and won't have to worry about getting canceled. The Middle East is the most ridiculously complicated place in the world right now. I like to call it the Islamic Thirty Years' War. For those that don't know, the Thirty Years' War was a war in Germany which tore apart the entire region, dragging in almost every country in Europe, while killing a third of Germany's population. The other thing is that the Thirty Years' War is also ludicrously complicated. There are hundreds of factions constantly squabbling, changing sides, and more. On top of this, Europe was rife with religious conflict between Protestants and Catholics, and beyond that, even between different factions inside of them. The modern Middle East is the same, torn by incredibly complicated religious conflicts. I'm going to have to simplify the Middle East to an absurd degree here, since this isn't really a video about the Middle East in the same way that if I did a story right before World War I, it wouldn't really be about the Balkans. The Middle East and Balkans are both the weak chain in the international system. As Bismarck said, if there's a war, it would be due to some damn fool thing in the Balkans. The thing I'm gonna keep reminding you guys of in this video is that the number one assumption you should have is that every player in this game is desperate. Starting with Israel. Israel is much more complicated than any area the size of New Jersey deserves to be. The Jews and Arabs are in an internecine conflict about who deserves the area. The Jews won militarily, but due to international pressure, can't just conquer the Arabs outright, and must have various political arrangements like Gaza being independent and the West Bank not being formally conquered. Although the birth rates have now equalized, for decades the Arabs had twice the birth rate of the Jews. This creates a large cohort of young Arab men who are also poor and disaffected, who want to push out and do something aggressive, which is the biggest fodder for war. The Palestinians have been aching for a war to find some way to win back the area. At the same time, as America is occupied elsewhere, I believe Hamas, the Palestinian rebel group, made that calculation. Meanwhile, the Israeli parliament is in gridlock. Center-right politician Netanyahu is very unpopular and is only holding on to power by a narrow margin. Israeli politics is incredibly complicated, with lots of strange political parties that put a certain subgroup of the population's interests as their main agenda. The Haredi, a radical Orthodox Jewish group who were originally demographically insignificant, but due to them averaging seven children per women, have risen to become 13 
15% of Israel's population. They've become a powerful political force on the Israeli hard right. Netanyahu has had to ally with this force, much further to the right, to stay in power to keep his coalition together. However, this has been at the expense of general support, as well as that of the Muslims. Thus, Netanyahu is in a rough position in which to keep himself in power, he needs to pander to the Israeli right, while at the same time, that alienates the neighboring Muslim populations, the global community, and the main Israeli public. You'll see a lot of catch-22s like this over the course of this video. As Hamas attacked Israel, the offensive made some impressive gains early on, but the Israelis were able to fight them back. And now the Israelis are currently in a bloody war to try to take over Gaza. Gaza is this tiny area on the border between Egypt and Israel. If Israel is the size of New Jersey, this is the size of Cape May, and I find it completely absurd global politics might revolve around it. As a side tangent, it was also pretty important during the Crusades. For complicated reasons, it's independent and is a super crowded Palestinian enclave with 2 million people. The Israelis are currently fighting through Gaza and have taken the northern half of the region. I would say from just an intuitive look, it's pretty obvious that the Israelis will win. However, I've heard the contrarian opinion from my friend Catgirl Kulak, who is a Twitter influencer, who said that that due to massive amounts of tunneling beneath Gaza, that Hamas actually can fight a successful resistance. And the short answer is that I really don't know. On an intuitive basis, my guess is Israel would win, but also I've been surprised before. And the general trend over the last 70 or so years is that more primitive and strapped down and guerrilla forces have been consistently able to beat much more advanced industrial ones. We saw this play out in multiple Vietnam wars, in Afghanistan, again multiple times, with the Russians in Ukraine, where the offensive abilities of industrial countries have proven to not be what people expected. And so I think there is a possibility that Gaza could just suck the Israelis in, and they're incapable of knocking them out of their tunnel network, and thus Hamas gradually bleeds the Israelis white until they give up, and they run out of money and international public support. Iran made some veiled threats towards Israel in case Israel attacks Gaza. And the way shame-based cultures, of which Persia is one, operate is that it's very difficult to say what the language is saying on purpose. And the next question here is, will Iran escalate to a war with Israel over these wars going on in the Levant. When I was growing up, the idea that Iran and Israel would be such big rivals confused me because they're hundreds of miles apart and don't share a clear border. However, the reason for this is that Iran is an Islamic revolutionary theocracy, which means that it has to have some kind of enemy to unify around, and the Jews are an easy target. Iran's been having political instability lately, with the large riots that have been rippling across it over the last few years being indicative. However, the problem here is that these rebels don't have any weaponry, and although I really don't know what's going on, it appears as if the ruling coalition has been held together, so a revolution won't succeed. This also combined with Iran's poor economy due to embargoes, which hurt their predominantly oil-driven economy, as well as the secularization of the nation in which the average Iranian is less religious than the average American, and Iran is a lower birth rate than the United States. All means that I could see the Iranians looking to use Israel as an external threat that they could unify their population around, and especially so also gain influence with neighboring Sunni countries where they can use the Israelis as an external force given Iran is a Shia country. The current generation of leadership in Iran is the same one as the one which launched the revolution 40 years ago. However, they are growing incredibly old, and what's happened in Iran is due to the extremely rapid secularization of the society, I could see a calculation being made by the leadership that they should launch a holy war as a way of reinvigorating the population so that they can maintain their power as their clique grows older, and it would be difficult to draw support from the younger generations. To understand the Iran-Israel conflict, it's important to know that Iran has a lengthy string of allies, which stretches from the Mediterranean all the way to the Indus. And the thing is, this isn't an Iranian empire. The Iranians are just funding sympathetic groups. 
where Iraq, you could genuinely say, is an Iranian protectorate. However, Syria is much, much more loosely so, and Hezbollah and Lebanon also very loosely so, and the Iranians have weak alliances with Pakistan as well. And what this means is that there's an arc of Iranian territory and Iranian allies which stretches to the borders of Israel itself and Lebanon. Iran's ability to organize this has been brilliant in my opinion and is ironically the biggest side effect of the U.S.'s intervention into the region. For a litany of reasons, it seems decently plausible that Iran's ally Hezbollah, based out of Lebanon, could fight Israel. And this might be a breaking point where Iran would choose to go after Israel. With Iran, I could see that they would look at the American empire and think that due to America's internal problems, as well as Israel possibly having to fight a two-front war against Hezbollah in Lebanon and Hamas in Gaza, that this is the moment of their lifetimes where they could most likely wipe out Israel and thus make that move. And again, the leadership of Iran has been been in power for the last 40 years, so they're old men now, and then been wanting to destroy Israel for that whole period, but they've been unable to. And so I might think, hey, if we're going to die soon anyway, why don't we make this die roll? We get to the issue here of die rolls, where for this to escalate from a regional war between Israel and Hamas to a global world war, you have a series of die rolls that fit together. And sometimes it's not even die rolls, it's dominoes where one successful die roll correlates the next one because it creates an incentive structure for the next decision to happen due to the previous decision creating more pressures upon the person making the decision. And honestly, what are the chances that Iran will declare war on Israel? And I'd frankly say not that high. Uh, I'd put it around 20%. And the reason I say that, and 20% is still a scary number that we should keep track of, is the statistical chances of war breaking out in any one given spot are pretty low. But when you add up a bunch of 20% shots, you get something like World War I, where perhaps the chance that World War I started in Bosnia were pretty low, but there were so many places where it could have started that one added up. Whether or not this does escalate into a broader war, I will treat the rest of this video as if it were to, to demonstrate the logic of how military escalation occurs. And even if a war does not start in this location, and again, I am not sure if we will have a world war at all, or rather a collection of smaller independent wars around the world, the same sort of escalation that could occur here could occur starting in Taiwan or Ukraine or other countries. I'm not here to talk about what a US-Iran war might look like. In fact, that's going to be what the next video after this is going to be about. But we're going to keep with the logic of going through each of these dominoes to see if Iran does declare war on America, could it move even further out? As we speak, the United States has been moving carriers to the Persian Gulf and Eastern Mediterranean and moving thousands of soldiers to Israel and this entire region. Region. And I think this is in case there is a war with Iran, but also to just cover damage that could possibly occur from the war occurring in Gaza. And the U.S. is basically covering its ass here. And it does mean that if there were to be a war, that the pieces are already moving. And we've already seen attacks on American bases in the Levant. Due to the U.S.'s internal divisions, I think that these attacks will be ignored unless the Iranians make a move first to go after Israel. There are a handful of reasons the U.S. might do this. One is that Israel is a strong American ally, and yes, if we're being honest, the Israeli lobby is strong in American politics, and Jews make up an incredibly disproportionate amount of the American elite. However, also, Israel has been consistently one of America's steadiest allies, and also, they are the only stable first world democracy in the region, so of course we'd like to protect them. The American establishment has a long list of wars in the Middle East and meddling there, Afghanistan and Iraq being the easiest examples. I think a decent amount of this is boomerism in that our elite are almost all baby boomers. I think this is why Russia, although I definitely don't think they're angels, were painted as satanic in the 2016 election and the invasion of Ukraine since our ruling class grew up when the Soviet Union was our main enemy. Even 
even though for me it's been obvious for my entire life that China, which has 10 times the population of Russia, was a much bigger threat. The people leading our country and military now are the very same people who planned the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, which occurred as I was being born. I know there was a desire to take out Iran, and I think a decent amount of this is just that sentiment. Important Republican leader Mitch McConnell has already called the war going on in Israel now a holy war. I do think there is the same calculation as well, that a war might bring people together and boost Biden's popularity. Presidents who start wars normally see a significant increase in their popularity, and this is a well-known thing in political circles known as the circle round the flag effect. Every single president in the 20th century who started a war got re-elected, which is something that I know must be on Biden's mind as we enter the new election cycle. The Middle East is also a vast oil producer. This has turned out to be less of an issue than it was before for the Americans. In the last 15 years, the U.S. has become by some metrics the world's largest oil producer in the world and a large oil exporter. This has been buoyed by the Americas with Canada and Mexico and Venezuela thrown in, are now a bigger oil producer than the entire Middle East. The U.S.'s allies such as Japan and Europe are still completely dependent upon Middle Eastern oil, however. Partly for this reason, the U.S. has been pulling out of the Middle East since the start of the Trump presidency and de-escalating its importance. Thus, it is pretty surprising that the U.S. is showing such an active interest in the region now. An important factor here is that by natural design, the Middle East should be unified. If you look over the last 3,000 years, the Middle East, and especially the Fertile Crescent, have been ruled pretty continuously by giant empires since the land is so dead flat. On top of this, the transnational political identity of Dar al-Islam, and the large transnational ethnic identity that is the Arabs, creates a cultural force which means most people in this region actively want to be part of a large empire rather than their shitty countries like Iraq or Syria. ISIS is the easiest example of this impulse. The Iranians have a pretty big sphere over the Middle East. If the US were to pull out today completely, there would probably be some horrible war that would kill millions of people between the Persians, Turks, and Saudis over regional hegemony, but out of it, in a couple decades, would come a unified Middle East. The Americans don't want there to be a unified Middle East. Middle East, which would be an aggressive power on the scale of power of India or China. Imagine if the Ottoman Turkish Empire from 1700 was a country today. Imagine how many nightmares that would cause for American interests. Also, said country would have a stranglehold over a majority of the world's global oil market. The United States has tried to block every attempt to unify the Middle East, whether Gaddafi, Iran, or Saddam Hussein being easy examples. This is another domino. The Americans have to make an active decision to have war with Iran over over this. Here's another chance that the war doesn't escalate. The outtake of this video for if we'll have a world war is I'm not sure. There are different layers where this war could be constrained on a certain geographic scale. The rest of the world will probably still have wars due to underlying serious issues that beset the whole planet in different ways, but they will be separate wars rather than being integrated into a full conflict at the same time. However, human history has shown that it is pretty common that all the dominoes do end up falling with both World Wars, the Thirty Years' War, the Seven Years' War, Napoleonic, and more being easy examples. I mean, hell, for the top war I'm comparing this to over this video, the Thirty Years' War, it started with some extremely complicated minutia about bohemian politics that spiraled off into a major war that pulled in almost every country in Europe. Another factor that would keep the U.S. from starting the war is the much greater threats of Russia and China, where the Middle East is really a tertiary strategic concern. I'm not going to get into what this war would be like. Maybe that's a future video. I do think conquering Iran would be exceptionally difficult for the Americans. Possibly impossible, but also, that's a different story. Another strange cross line here is that Azerbaijan and Israel are strong allies. And so, if Iran has a war with Israel, Azerbaijan will fight on Israel's behalf. And just looking at the map, this may look like an easy battle for Iran because Iran's so much bigger, but Azerbaijan has a very good military as we've recently seen with their wars with Armenia, and also the largest ethnic minority in Iran are Azeris. And so if the Azeris were to invade northwestern Iran, they'd be met by their co-ethnics who would probably support them. And thus, this would open up a nasty front against Iran if they were 
were to declare war on Israel. For the two other major powers of the region, Turkey and Saudi Arabia, I would have considered both to be strong American allies even a year or two ago. However, both are more now in the neutral camp where they could play either side. This is due to a combination of both Saudi Arabia and Turkey wanting more strategic flexibility, but also the Americans making ludicrous foreign policy blunders to annoy them so they don't want to work with the Americans anymore. The Saudis and Iranians used to be complete nemeses. However, recently they've patched things up where they're now in a more cooperative mood with the other. But that doesn't remove the factor that both on a geostrategic basis are rivals, with Saudi Arabia being the purveyor of revolutionary Sunniism and Iran being the purveyor of revolutionary Shiaism. And I don't know how long this detente might last, and it could fall apart at any second, but also with both the Turks and Saudis, I see them benefiting from a regional war between Israel or America and Iran, and with both sticking out until they can join it at an opportune time to push their interests while their enemies have weakened themselves fighting each other. The Saudis, Americans, and Israelis have constructed this weak alliance of Arab countries stretching from the Gulf to Egypt of Arab countries that are okay with Israel. After decades of fighting them, the Arabs realized it was better to work with the Israelis on a pure power level. And there's a reason that none of the surrounding Arab countries except Palestinian refugees, who are seen as troublemakers who rock the boat. A problem here is that all of these regimes are autocracies, and furthermore, not absolutely tyrannical ones like Maoist China or Nazi Germany that have complete controls over power over their population. And the ruling elite may ally with Israel for certain things, but for their majority populations, who are Sunni Arabs just like the Palestinians, they feel great sympathy for them and despise Israel. For now, Israel can count on Egypt to not rock the boat, but the problem is that for a lot of these countries, namely Egypt, which I've ranked as the country most likely to have a revolution in the next few years, is that if the Egyptian government does stuff that's too supportive, or even not antithetical to Israel in this war, they could have a revolution or change their policies because they'll realize they'll have a revolution. So all of Israel's Arab allies are weak at best in their support of Israel. You know how if you read early modern European history, the alliances are constantly fluid because each country is supporting its own interests, not that of some transnational goal. And so if you read 18th or 17th century history, France is constantly supporting the Austrians and fighting the Austrians, then supporting the English and fighting the English, and these alliances are constantly twirling around. And that's the issue with the Middle East, where all of these countries are supporting their own self-interests. And so they will make radical changes on the second, which turns this entire geographic region into a bunch of wild cards, where maybe the Turks would get involved in this war if it supported their interests at that moment, but I can't predict what Turkish interests will be in six months. And that applies to every country in this region. Something I want to just briefly touch on is how stupid the American foreign policy in this region has been. And I'm someone who you could call a neocon shill. I support the American empire, but I look at what we've done. And the thing is, this is probably true of every country in the region, but I, I'm i an American, so I know about our problems. And we've done stuff like alienate the Turks over the Kurds, a group who we have no geostrategic reason to support. We've alienated the Saudis over human rights reasons. Our invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan just resulted in our enemies growing stronger, even though we won the military campaigns, because we're incapable of actually maintaining a presence in the region. And we've alienated much of the Arab world through drone striking various countries and various human rights and attacks on regions we haven't had to. Because America has no skin in the game, we make horrible decisions based off political choices back in America, and then that gradually alienates the region against us. An important factor here is that any conflict in the Middle East will spur large amounts of immigration to Europe, which will further destabilize Europe, which is struggling to deal with that immigration now. This would spark a crisis of leadership inside Europe.
To pull back from the Middle East, let's start with the assumption that America and Iran are at war. What happens next? I, first of all, am not sure if America will be able to commit to actually having a war in the Middle East. America is in a uniquely bad place now, which I've explained in these numerous videos where I believe America to be on the verge of a civil war. In fact, this is why all of these countries are launching these attacks, since they believe America to be too internally divided to resist them effectively, and I actually agree. American society is so divided on multiple levels that it can't do anything without serious issues. Issues. Look at COVID, which ideally should have been something which brought us together, but in reality just pushed us further apart. Every single issue in modern America is polarized. The U.S. is in a tremendous amount of debt already, and we barely pass budgets every few months. And this is one of those issues where each budget might pass barely, and there is a minority shot that each time the budget has an issue that it does pass, but once you add up a bunch of shots each few months of barely passing a government budget, and then you throw in an external war in a very politicized society, is I just don't think the US would be able to fund that war, and trying to wage it externally would break us internally. As a scary point to make for the secular cycles I've talked about, such as the French Revolution, wars of religion, or black death, as I've said in too many videos, all the economic factors that predict them line up now. Also, in a truly disproportionate amount of cases, the driving event is a budget issue inside the government. I mean, that's what caused the French Revolution as an example. As I've said in my many previous videos, I think the US is on the verge of a revolution, and I'm not sure where this fits in with an external conflict. If the US does have an external problem, a problem has been that the military hasn't been able to get enough recruits for years. Also, as said before, an estimate by the military also found that three quarters of of Gen Z men aren't fit to serve due to obesity and mental health issues. To deal with these labor shortages, I could see the US military going for a draft. However, half those who are in the final eligible quarter of young men are in college, and thus of higher social class. In the classist society that is modern America, I don't think the political class could stomach a war where their children die at higher rates than the lower classes. If the US does try to have a draft, our society would completely fall apart. A point I'd make is that the only way the US could get young men, especially the tough ones that would form a core of leadership, to fight would be by pulling on right-wing values and a demographic of aggressive, heavily white young men that lean that way. They just couldn't get men to die for wokeness. That's insane. However, the problem is that the rightists they'd pull on all despise the establishment. I've said in many previous videos that modern America provides no incentive for young men to work inside the system and not reject it. If the government were to try to draft young men, what they'd be doing is free military training, weapons, providing shared leadership, and more to a group of young men who would then use that against their government. Even if it doesn't get that far, I think trying to have a draft or wage a war would cause mass social dissolution, as young men wouldn't want to die for a country or military that hates them. A war, or even a threat of war, would massively destabilize supply chains in the economy, likely causing rapid price fluctuations. The average American, and frankly, person around the world, is barely on the edge of survival now. If you make things worse, the social order just completely breaks down. You can already see the presages of this in that it is a growing truth that the downtowns of major cities in America are no longer safe. This is a global principle and will just make things worse. I think our boomer elite, who has no idea at the problems which face young men, will make a horrifying miscalculation about what they're capable of, and the system will blow up. On top of this, I could see the boomers trying to get a draft for Gen Z, followed by a vociferous, you fuckers dodged Vietnam, go to hell. This is another one of those hinge moments in history that is yet to be decided. The US sits in a place where it could either fall into civil war, revolution, or have an external war. This can be decided by a handful of decisions made by key leaders at the right moment. To jump to a completely different continent, the problem here though is that China has its own political problems, which I discuss in this video. As I've said before, I will bet good money China will have its own revolution in the next few years due to the profound systemic issues there. Chinese youth unemployment stands at 50% now, and they experience horrifying aging, in which their youngest and largest age bracket are people turning 40, who will realize that they will never be able to retire or have children, which will drive them crazy. Their housing market is one of the most ludicrously expensive in the world, in which people are completely priced out of anything, while their economy has taken a massive hit from foreign business pulling out in COVID. China, as I predicted a couple years back, 
has transformed itself into a Maoist state. The Chinese have done everything they would do if they were to attack Taiwan. The Chinese elite sees Taiwan as their war they can use to unify their populations, and frankly get rid of the young men who could potentially rebel. They have had an army mass to do so for years, have been stockpiling several years worth of food and raw materials. They also have literally said multiple times that they would attack Taiwan, and there have been several scares in which we've nearly had a war in the last few years. If the US is facing all of these issues internally, while also facing a war in the Middle East, the Chinese are in a position where they basically have to attack Taiwan. They've staked their reputation and honor on this, and have everything lined up for it. The question at this point is, can or should America even try to stop them? This is another dynamo, which depending on a handful of decisions, could add a completely new front to the war. Finally, you have Russia. Russia has been stuck in a losing war in Ukraine for years. They launched this attack, which I also predicted years in advance, due to facing many of the same issues as China. As I've covered in this video, I also think Russia is on the verge of revolution, and launched the war in Ukraine as a sign of weakness. This is further evidenced by them losing what should otherwise be a very easy war. My friend and colleague Philippe Fabry, who does similar historical cycles as what I do in France, has created the same model as me independently where there are strong parallels between the fall of the Roman Republic and the world today. At the same time, he has another historic cycle of imperialism. With this, Russia and China have to wage an expansionist war at this point to maintain internal unity. Under this model, which I think there's a shot of, is if America is facing these struggles, why doesn't Russia go for the Baltics or Poland when America is occupied elsewhere? There is a certain rebuttal to this that Russia is so occupied in Ukraine, which has also proved the limits of the Russian military, that it would be foolish to extend the war. However, desperate people do crazy things, and I could see Putin making a YOLO calculation here. Imperial courts like Putin's also tend to promulgate delusion-making over-calculations, like this much more likely. There's a profound similarity here between the fall of the Roman Republic and the present, which I cover through this video. The Roman Republic was facing many of the same internal problems as America today, of collapse in values, decadence, extremely high inequality, and more. What occurred was that Rome was stuck in its own civil wars, while at the same time, Rome's enemies such as Mithridates, the Seleucids, or the Cimbri and Teutones tried to use this to disrupt the Roman international order. The Romans were stuck between fighting their own civil wars and outsiders at the same time, in a nasty series of complicated wars. This conflict is weird. It could mean one of many things. Maybe things stop here, and this is just stuck in a war in the Levant that no one remembers. Alternately, they light a series of massive which causes a world war to break out. Or something in between happens, where the conflict is managed and kept to a certain geographic region. I'd be lying if I knew what was going to happen. The only thing I can say is that there's a shit ton of dynamite everywhere, and people have been dropping matches left and right. Thank you.